since all black people in antiquity belong to Africa, grew out of the African world. Our conception of the African world, however, is a very limited conception. It is limited because of the great amount of literature that we have read, which has created a certain distortion when it comes to dealing with Africa and Africans. In fact, most people are ashamed of being allied to Africa. Most people are ashamed of having African ancestors because the image that has been created by 95% of the literature in anthropology and history is an image of a primitive or at best a rural tribesman. In 1979, I founded the Journal of African Civilization. This has so far brought out 14 volumes. It has brought out books like Blacks in Science, Ancient and Modern, Egypt Revisited, Nile Valley Civilizations, Black Women in Antiquity, African Presence in Early Asia, African Presence in Early Europe, and will soon be bringing out a major work on African Presence in Early America, and a tribute to one of the greatest of modern African thinkers, Sheikh Antediop of Senegal. The reason why I have done this, the reason why I have devoted my life and energy since they came before Columbus to this kind of task is because one finds it absolutely necessary to revise the vision of the African, to revise the vision of Africa. The only images, the overwhelming images we have of Africa is either as primitive in the past or as a problem in the present. The object of this work, therefore, or these series of works, which is not just done by me, but which is done by a school of new thinkers throughout the world, black and white, is to give a totally new ground and foundation for African studies, to take the primitive off the center stage of history where he has stood for centuries, and to put on that stage the core and center of African civilization. Black people were not created by slavery. Slavery is a very, very recent chapter in history. It, it only goes back about 500 years. Beyond that, there are more than three million and a half years. It has been discovered, for example, by Dr. Leakey and others, and only within very recent times that man was born in Africa. And I'm not talking about ape man, I'm talking about modern man. It has now been established beyond the shadow of a doubt that 50,000 years ago, there were no people on the earth except black people. There were no Europeans in Europe. There were no Asians in Asia. There were only Africans. There are six stages in the development of man, and the last stage, which we are in, all of us, black, white, Asiatic, that final stage, which is known as Homo sapiens sapiens, is an African stage. The differences we see in people, differences in skin color, eye color, hair color, hair texture, bones of the face, etc., are superficial differences developed within specific periods of time in different ecologies. This has now been established beyond the shadow of a doubt. Whatever controversies still rage over this matter, there are controversies between people who refuse to give up in the face of truth. Only last month, February, Nature, one of the major scientific magazines of the world, published an article by 12 scientists, 11 to be exact, some from Oxford, one from Ibadan, Nigeria, one from the Department of Primatology in Britain, an article entitled Analysis of DNA Polymorphisms, in which it was shown that man was not only originally African in terms of his being born in Africa, but that modern man, that is man as we know him today, begins to break away from that central African thing and begins to undergo adaptations. Hence, all people have African ancestors. And we're not talking about this at the most primitive stage. We're talking about man with the cranial capacity, the brain case, the intelligence that we have today. It has been shown, for example, that the first 
women to appear in Europe. The first art, the first drawing of a woman in Europe on the case of Europe are of black women. And we are startled to find that the cave drawings we find in Southern Africa and in Europe in a certain period are the same. In other words, the first picture of woman on earth, whether in Europe or in Africa, is a black woman. The first women in Europe, the first European women, are black. This has been established not only from art, it has been established from the study of DNA polymorphisms, it has been established by studies of biomolecular markings in race, it, and it has been established by a study of the strata, that is the layers in which we have found the skeletons of early men and early women. Now, there are several myths in the world about man and woman. One of these myths which most of us know and which most of us have inherited and taken for granted is the myth of Adam and Eve. I'm not here to attack the Bible. The Bible is a remarkable work. A great deal of it is historical. A great deal of it is mythical. Mythology has an element of truth. The fact that something is myth doesn't mean it should be dismissed because very often myth is a synthesis or a summary of a body of real things. For example, when the Bible begins and says, man was created in seven days, there was darkness and then there was light. There's a symbolic truth in that. It couldn't be literal because there's no such thing as a day in the universe. Even within our little solar system of nine planets, there is no day. Even on this planet, there is no day. There are some parts of this planet has 24 hour days for six months, 24 hour nights for six months. There are 24 hour days which is general and normal, but there are also days which are 18 hours and there are days which are 12 hours and there are days which are 22 hours, etc. So even on this planet which was not then formed at the beginning of time, there is a variety of days. There are at least a hundred types of days just in our solar system. There must be therefore a million or a billion types of days in the universe. Hence, there is no such thing as a day. Therefore, God could not create the world in six days and rest in the seven because there is no such thing as a day. Those are nevertheless have those things nevertheless myths though they are their attempts by man to deal with mysteries to deal with things that are very difficult to understand unless you put them in a beautiful symbolic poem so a lot of things we have to take with an understanding that it is not a deliberate lie but it's an attempt to come to grips with a difficult truth such as the myth of adam and eve Man, we have shown, was not born in Palestine, as the Bible seems to suggest. No skeleton in Palestine is even as old as the last skeleton in Africa. In other words, there are skeletons in Africa of man that are at least two and a half million years older than those in Palestine. Hence, man could not possibly be born in Palestine. Man was born in the Rift Valley in Ethiopia. This is now established as science. It is no longer speculative. Nowhere on Earth, on no part of this planet, are skeletons of man anywhere else older than, say, 120,000 years old. If you find that you, in Europe, you will find it belongs to pre-man, that is pre-sapiens, Neanderthal man, etc., but not to the last man, not to modern man. Modern man begins about 120,000 years ago in Africa, and he begins to undergo serious adaptation, which is superficial, but serious enough for him to look different, at least at the phenotypical level, about 50,000 years ago. Some people put it much later, around 20,000 years, when the process seems to have come to an end and you have a settled normative adaptation. Now, what does this have to do with women? It has to do with women because we have to begin by looking at woman in this light. The Adam and Eve myth does damage to women. It's created by patriarchal society, and according to this myth, man creates, God creates man, and then he leaves woman for the last. He then thinks that man would be lonely, and he creates woman simply as a companion, as an afterthought, as a mere rib or appendage of man. 
We take for granted that all people in the world believe that. No, sir. Africans didn't. In Egypt and Ethiopia, where the first great civilizations are, there is a myth that is very different, the myth of Isis and Osiris and Horus, their son. And according to that myth, Isis was born the same time as Osiris, the man. So that you have man and woman from the very beginning, the first divine spark of life as equal. Myths like these, though they are myths, have profound impact on human behavior and human relationships. Just as the myth that blacks are inferior has a profound myth, though it is, has a profound influence on reality, a profound influence on the way people think, the way they conceive of themselves or are conceived of by others. It has a profound influence on their behavior, their reflexes, their prejudices, etc. This is the reason why we go back into history. This is the reason why we are so involved in going back to the truth of what happened, what is man, what did women do, what did men do, what the races have in relation to each other, what they contributed to the world, etc. We are ruled by myths. We are ruled often by false myths, by falsehoods that are so overpowering that they become the central basis and foundation of a civilization. And when those myths are terribly false, and when new discoveries begin to expose them, that civilization can begin to crumble. Because no longer do you have the certitudes upon which man builds his world. Those certitudes, many of them, have begun to shake and crumble within the last few years. Only within the last few years. Just a year and a half ago, one of the Earth's satellites spinning around this planet sent down radar beams into Africa 16 feet below the African Earth and discovered the traces of ancient rivers running from the Sahara towards the Nile Valley, which we now call the Middle East. I said that in my book eight years ago. The Earth satellite discovered that one and a half years ago. Only a few anthropologists dared to suggest that that was the case. And we were not doing it out of pure speculation. We were doing it out of a body of facts which were accumulating for the last 20, 25, or 100 years, some of them only 20, 25 years ago, some of them over the last few centuries. The scripts that we found written on the Sahara, the movement of skeletons down the, Nile, the, the Saharan world as it dried up towards the Nile Valley, blood veins as they shrank towards Ethiopia, moving up into Egypt the kinds of things we found in the plant life, the movement of plant life, etc. A study of many aspects of culture established that this was a fact. But one had to fight against tremendous resistance because books had been written which seemed to fix finally what was the truth of the world. The fact that man was born in Africa and that he was black, and the fact that the first Europeans are black, has nothing to do with racial inferiority or racial superiority. Man is a single family. Hard as it is to believe after five centuries of differing statuses and the way people have been treated because of the color of their skin or the shape of their faces, man has been established to be a single family. There are no species of man. And it is not true that man at home erects a stage, a very primitive stage, then began to diversify or differentiate into different types of man, European man and Asiatic man and African man. That is not true. Science shows it to us now that is not true. Man is one. There is only one race, one family. And the changes that we see are purely a result of many centuries in a particular ecological environment. During the worm stadial, we have shown we have seen from the skeletons subtle changes occurring. We have seen, for example, that the change of the nose, for example, in the tropics, in equatorial regions where it is warm, the nose expands. Features tend to be expansive. In the very harsh cold, and I'm not talking about the cold of the temperate zones today, which is no great cold, but the cold of ice, the cold of the ice age, features tend to contract sharply, so you get a narrow nose, you get 
contraction of feature. You also get changes of pigmentation. It has been established, for example, that the ultraviolet radiation in the deep tropics accounts for the screen of pigmentation. Melanin is critical in the tropics. In fact, albino does not live a full lifespan because albino is born like the white with inactive melanocytes, the Cro-Magnon type which emerged out of the Grimaldi Africoid type in Europe. In Europe, however, the albino, a mutation of the African albino can survive and can become a norm, normative type. This is what has happened. This is what happened over a period of 10,000 years in the ice. So that you get initially skin color change, hair color change, eye color change, which all happens almost instantly because Africans give birth to, to pigmentless children. Europeans do not give birth to pigmented unless they are mixed, but Africans can, without mixture, give birth to pigmentless types. And you get that albi albino mutation, which then becomes normative. It is at first a deviant type, but it becomes a norm, and then it begins to develop other kinds of adaptative features. The Asiatic is a mix between the two. You have Indo-Aryan types that are Asiatics who are closer to the European type or Cro-Magnon type, and Asiatics who are closer to the Africoid type as a result of the first waves of invasion from Africa. People ask, how could Africans go up into Europe? Why would they leave the sun and go up into the cold? That was no choice. Africa, in fact, for a long time was linked to Europe. Europe is only 20 miles from Africa at the nearest point. The movement of peoples over a long period of time as migration move out enables the African to cross into Western Asia and to cross into Europe. And that certain groups that go there move up into parts. There is a period in Europe when the ice is one mile thick and a change begins to occur. Let me come now to the question of women. It is important to begin like that because it's important for you to understand what has happened in terms of myths, both about the black as such, the African as such, as well as the woman as such. We take so much for granted in our world. And we take this for granted because few of us are aware of what a vast amount of misinformation we take for granted. So that a great number of the new discoveries in the world have not yet been not yet filtered down, they're only in technical journals. Most of us are not aware of what is happening. Most of us, for example, are not aware that it is only within the last seven years that it was discovered beyond the shadow of a doubt that Egypt is an African civilization. The people who saw the first Egyptians had no doubt about that because they were right there living at the time. The Greeks saw them and said they were black skinned and woolly ears. But there has been an argument about this for three centuries. The argument began because after the black was reduced to slave, after black men and black women were reduced to slavery, it was hard to believe that the Egyptian civilization, which had had such a profound influence on European civilization and Asiatic civilization, could be African, since the African could only be seen as a shattered person, an inferior person, a person who had no great scientific technological or great cultural heritage. The African was seen simply as a man in the bush or a man on the edge of civilization. We now know that that is not true. Within the last 10 years, we have discovered incredible things in Africa. Let me just name a few. We've discovered Africans were smelting steel 1,500 years ago in blast furnaces which achieved temperatures of 1,850 degrees centigrade, 200 degrees centigrade higher than any blast furnace. We discovered Africans using tetracycline 14 centuries ago. We only started to use it in the 1950s. We discovered that Africans were using aspirin centuries before us. We discovered that Africans invented the vaccine centuries before Jenna. We discovered that Africans were performing highly complex surgical operations like the caesarean section in the 1870s at the time when the caesarean section was totally unsuccessful in Europe when the mother invariably died, performing eye cataract surgeries early in the 13th century, plotting stars like white dwarfs 
plotting the orbit and trajectory of stars which are impossible to see with the naked eye. All of these we have only discovered in less than 10 years. The major discovery made is the discovery that Egypt, before the Egyptian civilization, there was a civilization in Africa, in Ethiopia, at a place called Kustal. We have discovered that at Kustal there was a civilization, a monarchy known as Tasseti, and that 12 black kings and queens reigned there before they moved up into Egypt. In other words, Egypt, there is a pharaonic civilization in Africa, south of Egypt, before the first dynasty in Egypt. It has been calculated by the American teams which discovered it, Keith Seal and Bruce Williams, that there is a civilization, a pharaonic civilization in Africa, at least two centuries before the Egyptian. They have found in that civilization every major element which is later to appear in the Egyptian civilization. They have found even the hieroglyphs, the world's first major writing system, which we thought was Egyptian and which is not Egyptian. The hieroglyphs were created by blacks south of Egypt before they moved up into Egypt. All these things are very recent. That was only revealed to the world on March the 1st, 1979, on the front page of the New York Times. Even that information, although it struck the headlines of the world, is totally unknown to most people. We have got to revise this because we cannot talk about black women in antiquity unless we know what black women are we talking about. Because as soon as we begin to talk about Ethiopian and Egyptian women, where most of the evidence lies, most of the writing has survived, because there's been massive destruction of libraries in various parts of the world. As soon as we begin to talk about these women in Egypt or in Ethiopia, people say, how could you bring that up since Egypt has nothing to do with blacks? Modern Egypt is not Africa. It is in Africa, but it is not African. It is only peripherally African just like America. There are almost no Americans in this room. There are Africans, Asians, Europeans. There are almost no Americans here. There are almost no Egyptians in Egypt. Most of these people who come there can have no claim, no legitimate claim to the pyramid, to the mummies, to the remarkable science of ancient Egypt. The Arab has no claim to that. The Arab only entered Egypt around 640 AD, which is thousands of years after the pyramids. Egypt has been invaded by at least five bodies of people since the great classical civilization. It has been invaded by the Syrians, the mighty power of Western Asia has been invaded by the Hyksos. It is invaded by Cambyses, the Persian. It has been invaded by the Greeks on the Alexander in 320 BC. It has been invaded by the Arabs. It has been invaded by the Romans. All of these people passed over Egypt and left their mark. When Sadat, the great president of Egypt, was here a few years ago before his assassination, Sadat got up on CBS and said, I am a black man, and I'm the first true pharaoh in 2,000 years. And what he meant by that, it was struck off the air, by the way. <laughs> He repeated it to Jesse Jackson. His wife would not agree with that, by the way. Because the Egyptians, the modern Egyptian, is just as, uh, just as prejudiced as most mulattoes who've had to depend on their power and influence through the white are. So you have to understand the present situation. You have to understand that when we talk about the great Egyptian, we are talking about a world that is no longer there. Why do we go back to it? Why do we talk of a vanished world and a vanished people? Why is it significant and relevant to the world today? The reason for that is that the falsehoods, the lies that have built the kind of images of people in this society and civilization are founded upon a, a distorted vision of what has happened in the past. If those lies continue, if that vision is not changed, if that history is not reconstructed and revised, all of the prejudices, reflexes, assumptions, and misconceptions which rule us and contain us within a certain box 
will continue to contain us forever. Man does not change until his consciousness changes. Consciousness does not change until, unless the vision of history changes. Man, therefore, is jailed, contained, imprisoned within a certain structure as long as he continues to think of the world the way he does. Hence, this is not dead history. These aren't dead things. Our mind is 90% controlled by what we think happened, what we think happened in the past. We may not be conscious of it, but all the books that are written, with the exception of very few, are controlled by those visions. We have seen, for example, in Ethiopia, incredible queens, known as the Candaces, the Queen Mother. These are women who reign with tremendous power and influence. The reason why the Africans created a totally different myth from Adam and Eve is because in Europe at that time, or in parts of the, the so-called Middle East like Palestine, etc., where patriarchal societies were in power, you have the writers or the thinkers or whoever call themselves prophets putting down certain things about women. Women, for example, are represented as having been extremely weak and corrupt. They yielded to Satan when he came into the garden. They, were, they allowed Adam to eat the, the apple, etc. So women from the very beginning are marked down. They can be treated as inferiors because they are weak. They allowed Satan into the garden. If you read the original of that story, which begins in Africa, because Seth, Tan, comes from the Egyptian. Seth, he is the serpent. And Isis doesn't allow him into any garden. Okay, she protects man. She doesn't betray him. In Adam and Eve, Eve betrays man, leads to his fall. In Isis and Osiris story, woman protects man. Hence you must have, if you have a myth, if you have a different myth, you must have a different conception. We take for granted, as I did when I was growing up, I took for granted all the things that this society takes for granted. Blacks are inferior, women are inferior. You take that for granted. You don't question those things because that is what you read. Every film you go to, every book you read tells you that. How can you question it? And you look around you, you find it in operation. You don't stop to think it's in operation because we think so. And we think so because the past thought so. And the past thought so and wrote it down and made it law. And made it scripture. So we take it for granted and we operate within those given. Therefore you cannot change racial prejudice seriously. And you can change relationships between men and women seriously or visions and conceptions of women or blacks seriously unless you begin to rethink seriously what happened that made it so. You can't just live in the present to change the present because the present is not present. The present is the past. It is 90% the past. And to assume that because it is past, it is dead is absurd because what happened 10,000 years ago or 10 seconds ago occupies the same room, the same time, space and consciousness. We are as much ruled by the 10,000 years of what we conceive happened 10,000 years as what we conceive happened 10 minutes ago. All the world structures and relations are determined by the past. It is not just the active life of the living present. Only 10% of the present is new. 90% of it is what happened yesterday, the day before yesterday, the year before, the century before, the millennia before. We are stuck in that past until we change it. We have found in Ethiopia, for example, that as a result of this myth of Isis as an equal, a divine equal of Osiris, we find that women are given far greater power. We find not only do they become queens of the state, but they also become queens of the spiritual capital. So that as even as late as the 25th dynasty of Egypt, in which the Ethiopians are in power in both Ethiopia and Egypt, we find that even when the men are the kings, their sisters or, da or daughters are queens of the spiritual capitals with as much power as the kings have, just as popes at one time had as much power as kings and sometimes even more power. 
we find as they move up into Egypt a certain battle. I am not suggesting in any idyllic fashion that it was a perfect situation. No human situation is perfect. Humans have ideals, they have visions, and they move in various degrees towards that vision. They never achieve perfection. The only thing that is really perfect is the dead. Okay. It is important to understand this that there was a greater tendency and a greater capacity and a greater um, movement towards that ideal of equality than anywhere else in the world. That is the reason why the black woman was worshipped not only in Africa, she's also worshipped in Europe at the beginning. Many of the goddesses of the European, the great European civilization, the Greeks, the Greek civilization, many of their goddesses are black. Artemis, the goddess of chastity, is a black woman. Minerva, the goddess of wisdom, is a black woman. Circe, one of the great figures in the Odyssey, Homer's Odyssey, and Homer was the greatest of the Greek ancient poets. Circe is black. She is represented as black on Grecian vases. Medea, who helped Jason win the Golden Fleece, he is black. She is black. Andromeda, who marries Perseus, the great Greek hero, she is black. Now we think she's white because if you go to, and you see it on the television screen or Hollywood produces it, obviously she's white. But when you go back and you look on the vases and the archaeological remains of Greece, she is black. And not only are the Greeks profoundly affected by these are living princesses and queens in the black world, who become mythological goddesses in the white world. And the white world, not as much as the black world, worships the, worships the black woman. That is the reason why we have the black Madonnas. The black Madonnas began with Isis. Isis, the divine wife of Osiris, is the prototype of the black Madonna. She begins by suckling Horus. I will show you a few slides at the end of this lecture and you will see how she's represented in Egypt and various parts of the world, in Russia, in Spain, in Poland, even in Britain, as far away as Britain, there were temples to Isis. Even the lunatic Roman emperor, who was a lunatic Caligula, erected a temple to Isis. He had the good sense to do this, although some Roman attempted to destroy the Isis cult. And you find that when Jesus dies, at first Jesus is totally unnoticed in the world. His death is not noticed. Jesus is just, um, to many people at that time, um, just a barefoot rabble rouser. But later on, when the Romans are converted to Christianity and Jesus begins to become the center of interest in the world, begins to alter the consciousness of man in many parts of the world. The first pictures of Jesus and his child, of, of Mary and Jesus, sorry, her child, are black. They are represented in Europe as black because they merely pick up Isis and Horus, Isis suckling Horus, and those are the black pictures, Isis and Horus, which are represented in Europe. Christ only becomes white when Michelangelo begins to paint him. I'm not saying he was black, by the way. I have seen the picture, the first picture of Christ in the world. He has woolly hair and brown skin. He has a Semitic nose. The Semite is a very, is mixed. You have Semite, Semitic types from Asia. You have mixing that we have Aryan mix as well as Africoid mix, etc. So that one is not saying that he is black but he certainly is not white. As Edward Kennedy pointed out in a debate a few months ago with that bigot, what is his name? Falwell, I usually forget, I usually forget people of that sort. <laughs> Kennedy said if Jesus was born in South Africa, he would be classified a cape colored or a black. And that is what he would be classified as if you saw him on the coin in the back of Justinian. Now one is not doing this or saying this out of any desire to show that Jesus is not white, he is black, because God transcends race. What one is saying is that 
while it is valid to represent God or, or your Christ or your prophet in any color you like that is close to you in order to be comfortable with, don't start imposing it on the world as though it is the literal truth. That is the damage. The profound psychic and psychological damage that has been done to black people the world over by not only impressing on them that they had no part in civilization when in fact their great first civilizations like the Egyptian and the Ethiopian had profound influence on the Greek and the Roman but even to suggest that God himself created a European when in fact the first person as, as, as an image of himself when in fact the first day Jesus met a European was the day he was going to die. One does not reconstruct history or attempt to introduce a new truth in order to create racial divisions but to heal them. Because what is at the root of racial division is this image, this false image that you have superior races and inferior races. And that you have one body of people who have made tremendous contributions and others have not. And we can't correct that without looking again at the history of the world. You go to Russia, you go to Poland, you go to Italy, you go to Spain, you go to early Greece and Rome and you will see black women in the churches. When these people appear, for example, they say some of them have maintained the black skin in the black Madonnas, but their faces have been made European and they say the reason why it looks black is because it fell into the fire. <laughs> Nobody denies the European influence in Africa. Today, Africa is profoundly influenced by Europe. Africans go to Europe, in universities to study. It was just the opposite in early times. When the Greeks under Alexander the Macedonian entered Egypt in 320 BC, every major Greek scholar went to Egypt to study. Some of them even claimed they went in order to give credibility to their credential. <laughs> Talas of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudocius, Anaximander, Anaximenes, Heraclitus, a whole range of them. Not one major scholar that won world fame that didn't draw and borrow from the Egyptian. This is not to attack Greek genius because the Greeks produced remarkable thinkers. It is to merely state a fact that no great civilization in the world, be it African or European or Asiatic or American, but drew upon other civilizations. Because what we have today, which we call Western civilization, is a result of the pooling of the genius of the world. It is not European in origin. If you study the more, and the Moorish thing is very important, because in the, during the period of the Moors, we have evidence of women doctors, women operating on equal levels with men in Spain under the Moors. The only place in Europe where the woman was allowed to operate as an equal in those times from about 700 AD right down to 1236 when the Moors lost their hold and later on their strongholds were shattered in 1492. You will find that even the gun which we think is a European invention, was not invented in Europe. Gunpowder was invented in China. It was taken to Europe by the Arabs and the Africans. The fire stick, the first fire sticks used in the world, which is the gun, the first machine to shoot a bullet was done in India by Arabs as Moors. The Moorish invasion of India, the Russians have recently shown that in Arabic manuscripts, centuries before Europeans used guns. They got it through the Moors. Even the ships that were used to produce slaves of the Africans and to shatter the civilizations of the Americas, those sails were Arab Latin sails which Arabs and Africans had used in other oceans. They were not European sails. It is true that after the conquest of these continents, that because of the massive and continuous movement of traffic across the waters, Europeans began to take the technological initiative, having reduced the world to state of destruction 
Africans, their empires had disintegrated, millions of people were ripped out of the bowels of Africa, and the, their technology came to haunt. Europe then seized the technological initiative within a short time, its hulls had improved, its sails had improved. But the first instrumentation in those ships, none of it was European. The compass was not developed in Europe. The astrolabe was not developed in Europe. They did not even have a capacity to deal with longitudinal and latitudinal coordinates which we find in an African map discovered in Egypt in 1513 by the Arab Admiral P.V. Reis. Columbus, who is supposed to have discovered it, he said in his diaries, and I quote him, he says, my pilots, I have eight or nine pilots aboard the ships, and they are like blind men. These are his exact words. My pilots are so ignorant, I am not even sure they can find again the lands I have discovered. <laughs> he struck out for the latitude of Japan, hoping to land in India. What is remarkable about black women who became queens and powers in the world is that unlike men, and this has to be said, I have studied as many of the black queens who've been documented in the world, particularly in Ethiopia and Egypt, because there is where the documents are heaviest. There is only one queen who ever used her power to start a war. Those women who, who pursued war, pursued revolutionary wars to protect their country. Queen Tetashiri, for example, in the 17th dynasty of Egypt, fought the Asiatics in order to protect her world, the world of Egypt. When Amos drove the A Asiatic invaders out, the Hyksos, his queen, Amos Nefetere, fought to build, not to fight. She rebuilt Egypt. Whenever you see a black queen in power, in serious power in Ethiopia or in Egypt, you notice during her reign, building increases, trade networks are extended. One of the most famous black queens in the world are Queen Makeda. Queen Makeda, the queen of Sheba, most of us have heard of her in the Bible when she appears, I am black and beautiful, O ye daughters of Jerusalem. It's translated in the King James Version, I am black but beautiful. There is no but in the original. <laughs> Queen Makeda establishes a trade network which is the most remarkable trade network in the world at that time. One of our chief merchants, Tamarin, just one merchant, had 520 camels and 350 ships, just one of our merchants. Solomon was excited by her beauty, but it wasn't because of her beauty that he lavished so much upon her, because she was a trade rival. She had an empire which included parts of Ethiopia, parts of Egypt, a bit of India even, other parts of the Middle East, etc. We know this for certain because there's a book the Kebra Nega, which has retained some of that. Ethiopia, by the way, has the most untranslated history in the world. We are now battling all of our scholars, and one of the most remarkable of our scholars died in February the 7th. He was the closest that had come to the decipherment of the Meroitic script. We have 800 and something texts in the Meroitic script, and we hope to crack the code by the end of this century. Those unpublished books, untranslated books, undeciphered books, contain a great deal of African history. Enough, however, has emerged in the Kebra Negat to show us that the Queen of Sheba ruled an empire greater than Solomon. And when Solomon built a bedroom for her made of crystal from the wall to the ceiling, it wasn't just out of a romantic interest. There was also a trade interest. She fell in love, he fell in love with her, and they gave birth to son. When she returned back to Ethiopia, she gave birth to a son called Menelik, which was the son of Queen of Sheba and that of Solomon. Menelik started what is known as the Solomonid line in Ethiopia, so that you have the black and the Semite, um, and that runs right down to Hale Selassie. With only an uh, interruption of 300 years, 
that blood right, runs right down from Solomon and Sheba right down to Hail Selassie, who only recently died. That is the longest, the most continuous, the most stable monarchy in the world. Today, Africa is in a mess. Nobody is going to say otherwise. But you have to understand why it is in a mess. Part of it may be due to Africans themselves. I have, I work and, and studied in Britain, and when I saw some of the Africans coming to, to British universities, I felt sorry for them because I know what happened to me in a British university. Were it not for my own visit to Africa and the shock inside of myself which turned everything upside down and made me vomit most of my, what I had been taught, I would not have recovered. But I understand only too well how many Africans imbibing without question the givens of European civilization go back into that world and create or perpetuate rather the situation that have been created for them. Our duty, our mission here, black and white, is to change that. That is not going to continue. Sheikh Anta Diop, who died on February the 7th, one of the most remarkable of Africans, has been able to show us a way to rebuild this world here as well as the world in Africa through a different kind of thinking. It's not an easy task to become aware of the terrifying things that are happening in the world today which can be profoundly affected by a new way of thinking. When we look at these queens, for example, when we look at the Candaces in particular, the queen mothers of Ethiopia, we find that all of them are involved in building. Man seems to be constantly involved, it seems. The male ego is often that involved that in, under many kings, great wars are started. Wars initiated by women are often revolutionary wars. This is not always true. There are one or two significant exceptions. There is a Jewish queen, for example, Queen Judith, who has such a passionate hatred of Christians, this is a black queen, that she charges in Egypt and Ethiopia and starts breaking up everything before her as with the same sort of lunatic zeal that we find um, in people like Cambyses the Persian. This is an exception. But in the 99% of the cases I have studied of black queens, trade and building are the major features of their reign. They build new temples, they build new architectural monuments, some of them have built pyramids. We can still stand under the shadow of some of the pyramids they have built, they have built trade networks. The two most remarkable queens, and one of them I particularly love is Queen T, that is why I put her face in the cover. There are two most remarkable queens from Ethiopia and Egypt are Queen T and Queen Hatshepsut. Why would, do I select these queens? The study of these queens is a study in contrast. There is Hatshepsut who challenges very powerfully the arrogance of man. Man's assumption that he is superior to woman, that he can push women around. Hatshepsut seizes power. In the Egyptian world, in spite of the African heritage of matriarchy, etc., you have a male priest caste that is challenging the reign of women. Women are allowed to reign when it comes to the end of dynasty, there's no male heir, etc. Women may reign as a shadow in the background, but when it comes for them to being queens in them, their own right, there are only a few of them, but Hatshepsut was unusual. She is considered to be a warrior queen, but she fights no wars abroad. She fights her rivals, her male rivals, and she defeats them. She brooks no nonsense. When they say, you cannot be a true sovereign, you are not a man, she takes the beard and sticks it to her chin and says, yes, I am a man, and I will rule as a man. And she does. For 50 years, no one can overpower her. She becomes the sole authority and power in the known world, because no people at that time, particularly in the 18th dynasty, which is the noonday of Egyptian power, no one in the world at that time, no nation at that time was that powerful, that rich, and that um, endowed 
with great talent. And her chef thought through her tremendous um, aggressiveness or assertiveness, as you would call it now, manages to maintain that power. Queen T is different. Queen T is one of those strange women who wields incredible power without you being aware of it until it is too late. She quietly sits, she marries at 13. The pharaoh who is 51 marries her when she's only 13. She gives birth to the most remarkable men in the world. She gives birth to Akhenaten. Akhenaten is what is known as the religious reformer. Akhenaten is the man who insists and he was to have a profound effect on Moses. Akhenaten is the man who insists that there is only one God, that no images are to be made of any other, that one God and one God alone should be worshipped, and starts a tremendous upheaval in the Egyptian empire. However, because of his commitment to this ideal, he neglects the defense of Egypt and Queen T, who is his mother, holds that power quietly and manages to protect Egypt from outside invasion. Her husband becomes old very quickly because as she becomes a young woman of about 38, he's already um, close to his 70s. He's becoming enfeebled by sickness, and it is to she that the powers of the world go, powers of Asia, etc. So she becomes the Secretary of State. She fills the power vacuum. And when her son Tut, King Tut, the Tankamun, is too young to rule, she is the power. So whether it is through the weakness and age of her husband, or the preoccupation of one of our great sons, Akhenaten, or the immaturity and youth of Tut, her son, she becomes the true power. And for 50 years, she is the center of power in the major empire of the world. So great is her influence that everything she does is, is followed. When she wears a wig, everybody copies the wig. Her eyeshadow is copied, her jewelry is copied, Everything, she's like what you do today with the film stars. It's just that she's not as superficial as the film stars because she has not just a superficial power, she has a very real and substantial power. These two women give you some idea, as I say, of contrast between woman's relationship to man's power or assumption of power. This um, sometimes leads to the shaming of man. Many of us take for granted that Europe just tired of taking control of Africa. No, sir, it did not tire. It was made to grow weary. The wars led to tremendous upheavals in the consciousness of Europe. The great certitude that had made Europeans smash other countries, that certitude was lost. They began to have real doubts about their superiority. How could you be superior and take the skins off human beings to turn them into lampshades? How could you be superior and destroy so many millions of young people throughout the world in a useless battle? The Germans, who were supposed to be the master race, the Aryans, were responsible for the greatest bestialities in the history of mankind. What superiority is that? Hitler was the logical conclusion of all the arrogance and idiocies in Europe for more than a century. Yeah. Europe was to begin to realize the best of Europeans, were to begin to realize what a tremendous tragedy had fallen in the world. That the people that they conquered and thought of as inferior still maintained certain human values which they could not, in spite of all of their lies and all of their self-deception and the deception of the world, they could not maintain that power because internally they were defeated. Do not misunderstand that. Do not think that the people who have the most guns necessarily win in the end. It may seem so at times. The Romans had a lot more than the Jews. When those Romans sat in the amphitheaters and watched the, the Christians being torn by the lion, they laughed and cheered, but do you think their souls did to see that extra?
extraordinary new courage in the world to wonder how could man have such incredible courage that he could stand against the lion and they with all their greatness and power would tremble. There must be some strange power in man that would make him stand against the lion, go to a lion rather than give up his faith. That led to a weakness in the psyche. It led to great um, weakness, a weakness that would eventually to lead to their downfall. It is not an accident. It is not an accident that eventually the Romans were converted. And the strange thing is, and a lot of people do not know this, that when Constantine, the Roman emperor, was converted to Christianity, who do you think was the Pope? A black man. Saint Miltiades, reigning from 311 to 314 AD. When Constantine gave back the property of the Catholic Church, when he stopped persecuting the Christians, it is a black man who was the Pope. We don't hear anything about that. It's not only black women we don't hear about. We don't hear anything about blacks in significant places in history. One of the things I remember and will remember for the rest of my life, because it is a wound that will always be with me, when I was at university in England, I was at the best school for African studies. It took me 10 years to get into university because there were no universities in my country. You had to come first for the whole country in order to get into university. I sat my exams three years again and again, the same exams to get higher marks so that I could come first for the whole country because only the person who came first for the whole country could enter university. And I couldn't do it. So I had to wait and work and wait and pray until one day I got into the university. And for what? to study about Africa. From whom? <laughs> I was the only school in the world that had more professors than students. I was the only person in the British Empire at that time that was doing Bantu linguistics and anthropology. So I had four professors. There were no, in anthropology, there were several students. If you go to anthropology class, you have students. But when you go to the linguistics class, I was alone. There is my professor. If I was sick, there was no class. <laughs> now that, you would think, well, how marvelous, what a tremendous education. Do you know, in the four years I was in London University, never once, never once did I learn a single thing about any African civilization. Never once. All my, my professors were world authorities on primitives. That was their only interest. I remember once turning to Dr. Knappert, who used to call himself my Dutch uncle. And I said to him, I have done a marvelous translation, I believe, of this Swahili poem. And he looked at it, he says, isn't this Bantu? I said, yes, sir. He says, well, why didn't you translate the Arabic? The Bantu are, do not have civilization. The Bantu don't, don't have a low class poetry. He said, these images you've created here, they're not really in the text. You made them up. You're a superior type of black. You made those things up because of your special education. Not a thing about civilization. All of these guys were world authorities and things like boogaboogas and boogaboogas. <laughs> they have created not only a fiction about the black woman, they have created the greatest fictions about black people in the world. We are ruled by this. Make no mistake, all these universities are ruled by it. This has to enter now the consciousness of the world, black and white, because the world cannot move forward. It is in a terrible state. Make no mistake, you have no idea of how dangerous the world is today. We are walking on fire. We are sitting in the mouth of a volcano. We cannot continue as it is unless we change our consciousness because this type of consciousness imprisons us and makes the confrontations in the world between the third, so-called third world and the first or second world, between Arabs and Jews, between all of these people, these things largely rest often on fictions and falsehoods, grievous hostilities that can never be healed wounds so great 
that the only way we can redeem ourselves and start again is to move away from fixed ways of thinking and feeling. And we know this only too well in relation, the relationship between men and women, because the relationship between the white and the black is similar to the relationship between the male and the female. In some instances, this is a real fact. These things spring from given assumption that this type of person, because of their race or because of their gender, is inferior. Do you know how many studies were made to establish that blacks had smaller brain cases than whites? Do you know they recently discovered that the Bushman has a bigger brain case than anybody else? So if that was that had anything to do with it, do you know they discovered that Immanuel Kant, one of the geniuses of Europe, had a half a brain the others had? All these lies and falsehoods. And the same thing was true of women. There are many studies showing you that woman's brain case is smaller than man. What on earth does that have to do with intelligence? The convolutions in a woman's brain is just as complex as that as a man. And when you go into the early art of the world, it's always of women. The worship of woman as mother of gods and men. When you go into the great empire, the greatest powers who leave the most lasting influence are often women, just as great as men, in spite of all the suppression, in spite of all the stupidities. And when you go into the life of particularly that of the Candaces, you see the incredible courage of women. When the Romans have everything before them, nobody is resisting the Romans. And the Manirena, one of the great queen mothers, the Kentake or Candace of Ethiopia, rises against the Romans. The Romans are so sure of themselves that they withdraw their army. And this black woman just marches on them and smashes all the statues of Caesar, breaks up all their bastions. And they're so shocked, they regroup a march against her and she retreats. And they think she's defeated. So they sit back again. The next two years she strikes and smashes everything again. And so it goes on until they have to make a truce with her. Queen Nzinga's resistance, Queen Asantewa's resistance, respectively to the Portuguese and the British, were to have profound influences on the death of colonialism. Colonialism is still with us. We would be foolish to think that Africa is free. The richest and the most powerful part of Africa is still controlled from outside. And even those that are controlled by black people, their brains are not African. Their direction, their focuses, their concerns, their conscience, their relationship to their people has nothing to do with Africa. So that it is as if we are still almost completely in alien hands. You cannot, by merely a change of faces, a change of skin, a change of power, alter the structure of the world. The structures of the world are altered by consciousness. Changes in consciousness must occur first before changes in structure occur. And changes in consciousness can only occur through a different relationship to the past. You have to understand what really happened in the past. Otherwise, you know nothing. When we go back into the past, we find, for example, many things that are given credit to others, we find their beginnings in Africa. We find, for example, in one of the most interesting essays in this book, Female Beauty, in ancient Africa by Camille Yabra. It's a, it is just a pictorial essay, but it shows you some rather unusual things. The first use of eye shadow, the first use of spices for breath fresheners, the first use of lipstick, though the lipstick, unfortunately, at that time was restricted to concubine. The first use of the, the range of hairstyles the Africans have the largest number of hairstyles in the world, from the cornrows, which goes back to the star of 5,000 years ago, to the most elaborate and complex hairstyle. But what I would like to close on is some of the very interesting relationships of black women to white men in Europe. The black woman occupied a very contradictory position in the mind of the European. At one 
At one and the same time, she's seen both as someone to lust for as well as someone to worship. Thus, on one hand, you have most of the kings of Europe have black concubines. For example, almost all the kings of France have black women as mistresses, even the poets of Europe, great poets of Europe. Shakespeare had a black mistress who was known as Lucy Negro, Clerkinwell, of Clerkinwell. He wrote an ode to her. Baudelaire, the great French poet, had a black mistress. And most of the French kings, even the Portuguese, three of the Portuguese kings have African features. One of the queens of Europe, um, Queen Charlotte Sophia of Germany, who eventually was intermarried with the British family. She's the great granddaughter of Queen Elizabeth II, she also has black blood. All this runs through the noble families, the Gonzagas, one of the popes, Cardinal de Medici, who became Pope Clement. He had a black mistress, gave birth to a son, who became the Duke of Florence. And you also find a very amusing story where King Louis XIV had a black mistress, and his wife, to pay him back, had a black lover. <laughs> and that gave birth to a child in the royal family who was black, plainly and unequivocally black. The, queen, the king was very astonished and he turned to his doctors and said, how could I give birth to a black daughter? And the doctor said, you see that black man in your court, Nabo, the pet of the queen, it is quite possible that while she was pregnant, he looked at her and the child turned black. And the king said, it must have been a very penetrating look. <laughs> now that led to scandal of right across France and she had to be smuggled into a monastery. You will see her picture in the slide. She became known as the Black Nun of Moray. And the Duke of Chartres fell in love with her and smuggled her out of the conflict, out of the convent, but the king would not give permission to marry her, and so she had to take back to the convent where later she died. Several black women became saints in Europe, and the odd thing is, as I told you, that in spite of the fact that they were seen with this great loss, they were also seen as saints because the black Madonnas are built on them. The goddess of chastity, strangely enough, Artemis is a black woman. The goddess um, of wisdom, Minerva, is a black woman. So that you have this peculiar contradiction and balance. Let me close by saying, because we will deal with slides and also we have questions and answers. Let me close by saying, we have only touched the surface of this subject. We have concentrated to a large extent on Ethiopia and Egypt because there is where most of the documents of these things lie. We've also concentrated largely upon queens and people of the great nobility because for great part in the life of the world, with true of Europe, Africa, and elsewhere, a lot of the records, the best records that exist in history, are always of those of the great courts, the great kingdoms, etc. Records of the common people um, do not exist until a later date. However, we can assume with certainty that what happens among the high families filters down to the low ones because they look up to them as models. It is not an accident that in countries where you have um, very superficial leaders or certain types of brutal leaders or despots, the quality of stupidity and the quality of brutality progressively improves. Um, I am saying this in all seriousness because people look up to those who are in charge and the kind of direction that comes from that leader, be it man or woman, filters down the structure of relationships all of these things pass down. It is not an accident, therefore, that the myths that develop in these societies profoundly affect social relationships. Let me close finally by saying this has nothing to do with a dead past. History is very urgent. It restructures the world. 
Let me repeat once again, what happened 10,000 years ago or 10 minutes ago occupies the same, same time, space and consciousness. We are not ruled by the little cell and room, by what happened in the little cell and room of the last four to five hundred years. We are ruled by what happened in the psyche and history of man for the last 500,000 or 50,000. There's a long span of life in the world before the slavery of Africans here in the Americas. We are entering into new cycle and phase. And it is not an accident that most of the great discoveries in the world, the discoveries about what blacks have done, what women have done, have only come to light within the last few years. When that begins to happen, when things that have remained buried and hidden for a long time suddenly come up to the surface, we become aware that something in consciousness is pushing them in that direction. Something has begun to happen in the world. What appears to be fixed and stubborn and immutable, what appears to be strong and stable can be weakened in a flash because something is corroding this civilization. No civilization can exist for 500 years built on falsehoods and great lies. And when the truth comes out of the earth, it still survives and resists that truth. We are learning more and more about our history, more and more about what black men have done, what black women have done. We do not learn this in order to establish some new superiority, some new cult of superiority. We learn this in order to bring about a new balance in the world. And in order to redeem us from the fragmentation, the deep wound to the psyche that blacks have suffered everywhere. We do this in order to heal, to make whole again that which has become shattered, that which has become frail, that which has reduced us to a state of weakness, a state of loss, a state of sadness. We do this because we feel that it can redeem not only the black man and the black woman everywhere, but the families of men. Thank you very much.